you know, we talked a lot about some of the issues yesterday, and I know there will be more details to come. So maybe it gives me the chance to be a little more philosophical about where we are heading. Um, I do work with a number of the companies whose products we're going to be discussing. Um, this breaks down into the pre-diagnostic and post-diagnostic spaces, both of which have been evolving quite quickly. And I really want to emphasize the point that, you know, I think Sigrid started to get to yesterday, and um, I know I made this point last year too at this meeting, which is PSA is probably the best marker in the history of oncology. It's just that we really didn't use it well as not just a urology specialty, but in primary care. Uh, over the years in the 90s, we tended to overscreen older, frailer men. The average age for a first PSA test was 68 to 70. Underscreened young and healthy men. And then when we found the cancers, we overtreated every Gleason 6 we could find and tended to undertreat the high risk disease. And PSA really doesn't have a great threshold. If it does, it's certainly not 4.0. It's probably closer to 1 or 1.5, as David talked about yesterday. Um, and we can do much, much better with early baseline testing. With all this, we've driven down mortality rates 50%. And yes, those have flattened, um, but it's still major, major progress in the PSA era. So imagine if we did all this better. And I'm just you know, setting this up because the fact of the matter is the bar is pretty high for a new entrant to the clinical pathway to prove that we can actually do better because PSA really is, and as far as I'm concerned, will remain the best first test for the foreseeable future. So what can we add to PSA? Well, it's getting harder and harder to make this slide because the font is getting smaller every year. Um, there are more tests these days than we really know what to do with for every single clinical decision point from, you know, do we check a PSA on through how do we event manage um, advanced disease. In this pre-diagnostic space, uh, of course, we have blood, urine, um, and, um, and saliva tests, as well as MRI, all kind of competing in this space for what do we do with men with elevated PSA. Um, and you know, the reason I have the, the PCPT calculator up here, again, is that it's really important to ask the question, you know, not just does the test accurately stratify men, but what does it add to what we already know? We already have a lot of information on the chart for the men pre-marker. We know age, we know race, we know PSA, family history, uh, DRE findings. You know, DRE is not a good screening test, but it's certainly an important evaluation for somebody with an elevated PSA. And at that point, it's not screening. It is actually quite important. Um, you know, so we use tests like this. This is the one tool I actually do use in clinic. This question came up yesterday about, you know, do you have a threshold? Uh, when Ian Thompson presented this years ago, um, he made the comment that you can take two well-educated men, show them the same graph with an 8% chance of high-grade disease. One may choose to get a biopsy, one may choose not to get a biopsy. Those are both perfectly adequate, well-informed decisions, as long as they are informed decisions. Uh, you know, and what about MRI in relation to all these markers? You know, it, it was interesting that the graph results yesterday that, you know, MR is being used or adopted uh, way more than the liquid markers. Uh, but the consistency and the accuracy of the PIRADS grading system remains a massive, massive problem. This is the positive predictive value for having a PIRADS 4 or 5, depending on which high volume academic medical center your radiologists happen to live at. This is a big review by um, Antonio Westphalen a couple years ago. I promise you things have not changed since 2020. The PPV by center ranged from 25 to 75 percent. At Stanford University, one university that had the courage to kind of publish their own institutional results, uh, within the institution, PPV ranged from 40 percent to 80 percent, depending on which radiologist happened to pull your exam off the top of the queue. This is not acceptable if we're going to use this as a tool to decide who gets a biopsy and who does not. MRI is great, PIRADS is terrible. And you know, we need to get to the next generation of you know, AI tools and uh, better ways to use the data coming off the magnet before we're going to be able to use this as a screening test. MRI is a beautiful adjunct. It helps us do a better biopsy. But as far as a test to decide whether or not, whether or not to do a biopsy, the liquid tests that we heard about yesterday have much better, more consistent negative predictive value, and in this country are cheaper. You know, in Europe, it costs $300 to do an MRI. Pretty much everyone in the world, it costs $300 to do an MRI, except here, where it's still thousands. So as a secondary screen, you know, in, in our practice, the liquid markers um, have a greater role. And the markers, including MR, you know, are an absolutely essential part of a smarter screening strategy. And both Sigurd and David alluded to this yesterday. We have now implemented this pathway in UCSF and primary care baked into our electronic medical record system. We're using a threshold of one. Um, you know, the median of the population is 0.7 for PSA at age 45. By the time you get to 60, it's one. 
Um, and the idea is if your PSA is under one, you're basically done for life. You know, the studies that they've done in Malmo and elsewhere, you can predict forward 25 years and predict nothing's going to happen if your baseline is under one. We are saying, you know, potentially recheck in five or more years. Um, if the PSA is over two for men 45 to 60, or over three for men over 60, uh, 60 to 75, we're recommending referral. And in between, uh, there is plenty of room for shared decision making, gray zone discussions. Here we look at family history, race, et cetera. Uh, but this referral, whether it's a PSA over one or a PSA over two to three, means secondary testing. Nobody in our institution is going to biopsy without liquid markers and or MRI, and often both. And you know, how do we answer that question? What do we do first? Here, we really don't know. Um, and you can go around the world, around the country, and find all of the different options used in different locations. You know, in the UK and elsewhere, this is baked into the NHS pathway now. You get a PSA, you get an MR. If the MR doesn't show a lesion, you do not get a biopsy. Um, other places are using the markers very heavily. Um, you can do marker first, then MR. You can do MR first, then marker. You can do both. You know, our practice at UCSF probably looks most like this most of the time. Uh, where we're getting a marker to decide whether or not to do a biopsy, and then using the MRI to help us do a better biopsy. But the MR itself is not usually the, the uh, deciding factor in terms of do we proceed with biopsy. There's other places that flip it. You know, they, they get the MR first. They only get a marker if the MR is equivocal. Or if they do a biopsy despite a lesion and don't find anything, they'll use the marker to try to decide was the MR finding uh, false positive. But you really can find any and all of these, of these uh, different paradigms. And nobody has really proven to any extent which one is the best. And it really depends on local environment, how good the local radiologists are, and what the relative costs of these different uh, measures are. Now, what about post-diagnosis? Uh, once we've got the di diagnosis of prostate cancer here, it's a different question. And here we're really trying to improve risk stratification. Uh, this is the oldest slide, I think, in, in my deck, with the exception that you know, focal therapy is now increasingly part of the paradigm. Uh, but you know, active surveillance is the treatment for low-risk disease in 2023. Um, and you know, the, the role for markers here really should be in the gray zone. We know Gleason 6, gray group 1, should be managed with surveillance, period. The whole first part of the talk, we're trying really, really hard not to find gray group 1 tumors, right? We're using markers, we're using MR. The whole point of these things is do you have a gray group 2 or higher versus do you have nothing or do you have gray group 1? We are explicitly classifying gray group 1 in with the nothing, benign category. So if we find gray group 1, we should not be treating it. Um, and again, just as we need to be thinking about the age and the family history, et cetera, when we interpret a, a pre-diagnostic marker in the post-diagnostic setting, again, we need to know everything that we have available for free on the record. So a multivariable assessment of PSA, Gleason score stage, number of cores involved, PSA density. There's a lot that we know for free on the chart. Uh, so just substratifying the NCCN risk groups, which are terrible and outdated, um, is really not sufficient, because these tests are, are more expensive than liquid tests, and we need to make sure we've gotten as much mileage as we can from the, uh, from the clinical information before we bring a new marker to bear. Uh, how much of an improvement we need to see in terms of you know, an improvement in an AUC or a C index, this is not necessarily that well defined. And how we integrate these with imaging is really not, not well defined. Um, it sort of goes without saying that if you're using a tissue test and you did a targeted biopsy, you should probably be using the core that came from the target. Um, but we also know that there is heterogeneity uh, within given prostates, even within, within given tumors. And this is an area that is still you know, subject to some degree of question. So in terms of the risk groups, you know, this is still the starting point, of course. Um, the NCCN risk groups in 2023 are totally outdated. These are way, it's become incredibly cumbersome. I would challenge anybody in this room to rattle this off from memory. I usually can't do it because it's different from the AUA risk groups, um, which have different versions of favorable versus unfavorable intermediate. You've got different criteria in each of these boxes. This is non-linear, non and we really need to move on. Um, the AUA has actually eliminated the very low risk group, which is appropriate. The NCN, NCCN still has it here. We don't find this. UCSF, we have not diagnosed a, low, a very low risk tumor in the last three years, partly because uh, we're trying not to biopsy people that are going to have very low risk disease. Um, and also because in the era of targeted biopsy, it's very hard to not hit 50% of a single core if you're doing a good biopsy. So very low risk really is irrelevant. And the conversation is, is about low uh, versus some of the higher ones. Now, there's progress in the NCCN guidelines, at least in the small print. You know, those risk groups are still the same cumbersome outdated system, but they do at least now endorse some of the multivariable measures here, um, and they're increasingly endorsing uh, the 
tissue-based tests, so Decipher, Polaris, and Oncotype are all now endorsed in the NCCN as uh, potential tools to help risk stratify prostate cancer. And the one that has made it here very, very rapidly is Artera AI. Uh, this was on that initial slide. This is a, a new tool, which is just, I mean, it's amazing they're in the guideline already. It's only kind of barely becoming clinically available. This is a tool using an, an AI approach to the standard H&E uh, to try to do some of the same things that the tissue tests are doing. I think a lot of the discussion these days is really not about gleason 3.3. Again, those should all be on surveillance. It's really about the 3.4s. Um, and again, we know from the clinical scenario that not all of these are created equal. You can look at a glance at these two patients and clearly say that they have different risks. They should probably be managed differently, even though they are categorized exactly the same in the uh, NCCN categorization. We are looking at things like PSA density and the subtype of pattern four um, increasingly, and these are very uh, reliable measures of which are higher versus lower risk. And again, if we use the right tool, this is the CAPRA score, you can use nomograms, you can use star cap, you can substratify risk very, very accurately without even having to use the markers. And this is 85% accuracy out to 16 years in terms of cancer mortality uh, by the CAPRA score in this case. So again, as in the pre-diagnostic space, the bar is actually pretty high to prove that we can do better. Um, and again, PSA density, extent of pattern four, et cetera, this is really where the, the clinical focus needs to be these days uh, before we even bring the markers in. So we do have this increasing uh, set of markers, a little less activity here in the last few years than in the pre-diagnostic space, uh, with the exception of this AI platform that I mentioned. Uh, this is not something that you can quite order yet, but they're making very, very quick progress. This is kind of a spin-off of, of Salesforce. And the nice thing about this is it's all a, um, because it is all based on standard H&E, &E, um, there's really no, uh, there's not much in the way of additional technology that needs to be brought. You just mail the slides to the company, they scan them, and they will run these algorithms. But they're still being developed. So, you know, again, it's kind of interesting that's in the guideline already. It's not quite clinical prime time yet. So. We've got Polaris, Decipher, Oncotype, we've had them for 10 years. Do they improve prediction? The answer is without question, yes. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of studies um, showing that they do improve, not just on the NCCN risk groups, but on various nomograms, on CAPRA, on pretty much any clinical tool. Uh, we do a better job in stratifying risk uh, when we add a marker to the clinical information. But have they helped us make better decisions? And I think here the answer is really unclear. The clinical utility studies that get done are okay. I mean, they certainly do suggest that different decisions are being made. Uh, that is not the same as proving that we are making better decisions or that we're improving outcomes. Uh, but they definitely do have an impact when they are used. Uh, but the question is how they're used and who's getting access to them. There was a great study from Michael Liebman, who's a former fellow of ours. Um, you know, it's harder to get data on, on uh, biomarker use than on MRI because there's, you know, they're typically ordered by fax and reported by fax. You know, the coding for this is much harder to, uh, to access than for MR. Uh, but he got access to really good commercial uh, payer data here and found, not surprisingly, there is massive variation from place to place in terms of the adoption of biomarkers and the, depending on which hospital referral region you're in, there's about 250 of these around the country, the proportion of men uh, with newly diagnosed disease getting biomarkers ranges from zero across many of them to nearly 50% of all diagnoses. We don't know what the right number is, but it's certainly more than zero and it's probably less than 50. But the point is this kind of variation is, is always problematic. We see it everywhere. Um, and, it, and it is a bit of concern in terms of who has access and who's actually getting them. And how do we communicate the results to the patients? And here we really have no idea. We already throw all these different numbers at men um, and you know, they've struggled to make a good decision. You know, we add to this a Decipher score, a Polaris score. You know, is that really getting them to where they need to be to, to making a better decision, the right decision that's gonna get them a better outcome? And we really don't know. I think even as clinicians, we often don't know what to do with these numbers. And this is true for pyrads, just as it is for the markers. And this is a particular problem in settings of low health literacy. This is a really nice actual randomized trial that Adam Murphy did at University of Chicago uh, using the Oncotype test. And it turned out that in the patients with average health literacy, Oncotype for men with low risk clinical disease who got an Oncotype, in men with um, average health literacy, uh, there was not that much of a difference between the control arm and the intervention arm. But in men with low health literacy, those that got a GPS were actually slightly less likely to get active surveillance. And this is in large part, I'm sure, because the way the test is formatted. And this is a big, big issue. You know, the tests get developed, uh, usually in academic collaboration, and there's a lot of science and a lot of um, statistics that go into it. And then the reports get made by the marketing departments. And, you know, I, I used to beat up on the Oncotype test here. Uh, Prolaris 
Now, one surprise as the worst report in the business. Um, this is absolutely outrageous. You cannot tell the patient what to do based on a single test. This is ridiculous, okay? And it really, I mean, look, we, got, we, we did the validation study that put Prolaris on the map. They're a great company. I like the test. But this report is terrible, okay? It is dangerous, and this is not what we should be doing with patients. And there's absolutely no statistical validity to taking a piece of paper and telling the patient, your score is under this threshold, therefore you do surveillance, okay? This is not the right way to use these tests. And it's frankly, I've, I've never seen one do this before, and it's not, you know, I realize there's a desire on the part of you know, many community urologists to have it simplified like this, but this is not the way we can use these information. Because, I think, you know, um, David already mentioned this slide yesterday, uh, you know, none of these things is a pregnancy test, right? We all want it to turn blue, you take out the prostate, if it doesn't, you leave it alone. You know, all this tells you is where on the spectrum of grays this cancer is. Is it lighter gray or darker gray? This is another tool, another, another piece of information that we bring to the clinical encounter. When it comes to low-risk disease, I just want to emphasize that, you know, in the, uh, the PIVOT trial, for all of its problems, men with low-risk disease, it's not like there was even a hint of a signal in favor of treatment. You know, this was Gleason 6 diagnosed by a sextant biopsy with no MRI done by a resident in the VA in the 90s. Okay, worst case scenario for under sampling and there was no benefit to intervention. So we need to be thinking pretty hard about how, how hard we're looking for trouble in terms of the high risk. And finally, I do wanna bring this back to the screening discussion because at the end of the day from the public health level, we don't start these discussions as primary care. And the, the problems highlighted yesterday that we've stopped the decline, we've stopped seeing the decline in prostate cancer mortality uh, is related to primary care screening practices. You know, incidence rates are going up again, we're screening a little bit more. But we've got to convince primary care um, as a community that we are not over-treating prostate cancer. And the markers can really help us here. Uh, we can avoid diagnosing Gleason grade group 1, and we really are doing that. The proportion of men with grade group 1 is falling every year. We really should stop calling it cancer when we find it by accident, because that's what we're doing, is finding it accidentally in the course of looking for grade group 2. So why we brand these patients with a cancer label is a little bit beyond me at this point. I think it can build confidence about surveillance for men with grade group 1 who are a little bit worried about it. Uh, but the fact is most men with grade group 1 don't need markers. They should just be on active surveillance. Uh, I think a lot of the interest here is which of the grade group 2s um, are appropriate for active surveillance. And if we do all this well, we can really make great strides, I think, in terms of driving down overdiagnosis and overtreatment rates still further, and in doing so, convince the task force that we deserve at least a B for screening for using, again, the best test in the history of oncology. So I'll stop there and uh, take any questions.